All right, so Dr. Sharkey, uh, I think it would be good if you could just introduce yourself a little bit to everyone. You're Fayetteville's public health officer, so if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Yes. Um, my name is Marty Sharkey, and I am the city health officer for the city of Fayetteville. I was nominated um, by the mayor and the board of health and voted into office technically um, by the city council back in July. And I have a background in vaccine research um, and infectious diseases, as well as a master in public health. I was born and raised here in Fayetteville. I left for college in medical school, did my um, pediatric residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And now I've been back here in Fayetteville practicing medicine for going on 20 years. And of course, your, your role as public health officer is to uh, work with the city's board of health, who then in turn make recommendations to the city administration, correct? Right. So it is, I answer to the board of health, but my role really is a liaison and educator to get information to the people that they that need it in order for them to make the best decisions possible. Um, and that includes the mayor on down to everyday citizens. Perfect. And so speaking of everyday citizens, we got uh, a plethora of questions from our readers, touching on a whole bunch of different aspects of this pandemic and how it relates to our region. And so we'll just go down the list here. Uh, we had a question here from a reader. Uh, the question was, are we to wear a mask and socially distance? And this person mentioned how they go to the grocery store, for instance, and they'll see people wearing masks, but they're not six feet apart. So the question is, is it an either or situation? Is it both? What's, what's your take on that? So it is not an either or, it is a both. Um, both are equally important. Um, so wearing a mask, and maintaining the distance of at least six feet from one another um, is really critical to decrease the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, and that is the virus that causes COVID. It is considered to be a contact um, by Centers for Disease Control if you are within six feet of a person for more than 15 minutes, regardless of whether or not you're wearing a mask. Um, while the timing though is important, so more than 15 minutes. So the reader mentioned the grocery store scenario. So if you and the person you're in the aisle with are both wearing a mask and just walk past each other in the aisle, the risk of transmission in that scenario is very minimal. It's not zero. I mean, the only way for it to be zero is you know, we're in a sealed up and cocooned in our homes. Um, but that scenario is, is, is fairly safe. Um, you know, again, no, the risk is not zero and you don't want to stand next to somebody for, and chat with them when you run into your neighbor in the grocery store. You know, those days are, are not happening at the moment. So six feet with a mask, you know, that is ideal um, and trying to limit your interactions to as brief as possible. If you cannot maintain that six feet, um, the best way to interact with, with each other is outdoors, socially distanced for at least six feet, um, preferably with masks on to really decrease the transmission. All right, Dr. Sharkey, so we've got a question here that I've heard a few times from people. Um, the reader asked, I've heard people saying that if you have had the virus once that you won't get it again or that you're immune to it. And is that true? Unfortunately, that does not appear to be true. As we are learning about this virus and time goes on, what we are seeing is that some individuals have been reinfected a second time. And just this week, there was a report of two individuals in India who had COVID back in April and then tested positive again. And it just so happened that they had viral isolates on both of these times that these individuals tested positive and they were two different strains. Um, so there is documentation of people getting infected a second time, and we know that it was not a persistent positive test. It was actually a new infection um, in these cases. Um, what we also are seeing is that the antibody levels drop fairly quickly after people have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, about three months after their, their illness. 
The good news on this is that in persons that we've seen second infections with, the second infections have been mild or asymptomatic. So there does seem to be some immunity to the virus if you get infected with it a second time around, but it is not 100% immune um, over time. The antibody levels do wane and people do seem to be able to get the virus a second time. So this isn't like the, the mumps or anything like that where you typically get yeah. it once and, and then you're yeah. or mono. It's not chicken pox or mono or any of those. This is um, something that you can get, it appears, you know, at least twice and, you know, six months from now, we may be saying three times. You know, that's just something that as time goes on, we're gonna learn and we are learning. Uh, this is a question we got numerous times from a lot of readers. There's a lot of interest in this particular topic. Dr. Sharkey, can you catch COVID via your eyes? So yes, it is believed that you can catch SARS-CoV-2, um, the virus that causes COVID-19, through your eyes. And the reason that this is believed is that the cells on the surface of the eyes express the ACE2 receptor which is the receptor that the spike protein of the coronavirus um, attaches to, to infect cells. Now, we have not done a study where we've actively tried to infect people with, with SARS-CoV-2 in that way, obviously, um, but in theory, that is a possibility. In addition, the um, coronavirus has been isolated in people's tears who are infected with it. So it could not, not only can you catch it through the eyes, it's potentially you could spread it through your tears. Um, so therefore that is the recommendation to avoid touching your eyes as much as possible and for healthcare workers to wear protective eyewear um, as part of their uh, personal protective equipment. So is it a good idea for someone who's not in healthcare to, in addition to wearing the mask, to also wear protective eyewear when they go out to the grocery store or anything like that? It's not going to hurt. It's only going to help. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> oh, and then, yeah, then that comes down to like, do we need to worry more about people who wear contact lenses and are messing with their eyes more? Are they more prone to it? I think that there's going to be some studies coming out looking at that aspect of it eventually. All right, Dr. Shark, we had a question about the vaccine that's been on a lot of people's minds. Uh, this reader want to know how effective will or could a vaccine be? Well, we will not know how effective any of the vaccines that are currently being developed um, will be until they have completed the phase three trials. And that is when vaccine efficacy is evaluated in vaccine research. It's in the third phase of the trial. And during phase three, that's when the vaccine is given to tens of thousands of individuals. Um, and so when we talk about vaccine efficacy, we're talking about does the vaccine um, prevent disease? Does it prevent infection with the virus altogether? Or does it just prevent symptomatic infections? Um, what sort of antibody levels does it produce? And how long does it, do those antibodies then stick around for? So there's a lot of components to how effective a vaccine is. So that those are what phase three trials look at. Now, both the Federal Drug Administration and the World Health Organization have stated that they will only approve a vaccine that is at least 50% effective um, and induces the immunity for at least six months. Now, that's not gonna be our ideal vaccine candidate, but that's the minimum bar that they have set to approve a vaccine. All right, Dr. Sharkey, we had a question uh, pertaining to residents at long-term care facilities. Uh, this person wanted to know, at what point does isolating residents in a long-term care facility from COVID become detrimental to their mental and physical health? So right now we are faced with the heart-wrenching tension between protecting the medically fragile older adults from the virus and cutting them off from outside support and connection that is vital to their overall well-being. Um, data on the mental health effects of the lockdown is scant. Um, however, more than 70,000 long-term residents and staff have died from COVID, and that accounts for four out of 10 deaths that we've had in the pandemic from COVID-19. Um, some states, um, including Minnesota, um, 
have now added um, some things to their death certificates, uh, listing social isolation and failure to thrive as reasons for, for some of their deaths during the pandemic, which is just, again, heart-wrenching and heartbreaking. Um, facilities are working hard to overcome this problem. And Arkansas recently changed their guidelines regarding visitations to nursing homes. Um, at first, you know, the first several months, there was absolutely no visitation. And then starting July 1, if a facility had had no cases of COVID-19 in the elderly or their caregivers, their staff, for 28 days, then visitors were allowed in. And he recently shortened that time frame to 14 days, and then also put in an exception that if a member of the facility was struggling with adjustments, loneliness, and illness, then a family member could be could be let in to provide them support. But it's absolutely heartbreaking again what we've seen happen in our nursing homes as far as the deaths from COVID-19 and then also the mental health aspect of it. Um, time's gonna tell um, whether in retrospect we think what we've done was, was worth it to save the lives that we did. And even despite what we did, we still have lost so many and we're gonna lose more, unfortunately.